You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coonhounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. I'll be your host today, Trevor Wade, Coonhound Program Manager here at UKC, and I'm joined by the Director of Hunting Ops, Alan Gingrich. Alan, how you doing? I'm doing well. You know, the, it's getting cool up here. Fall's in the air for sure. You know, it was. I went out to my truck here at lunch a little bit ago, and it's kind of chilly today. Yeah, it came on quick. We, we've been going to Autumn Oaks in the world, and we came back, and fall is all the way here in, in southern Michigan. Yeah, it's hard to believe just a week ago, you know, we were headed to... Um, Tennessee for the world championship was in upper 90s, you know, and today we're back here in Michigan a week later, and I don't know what the temperature is, but it feels like, you know, maybe upper 50s, lower 60s, somewhere in there. It's a little chilly. Yeah, what that means is it's about to be the best time of year to run that, dogs. That's exactly right. You Boy, got your, you can feel it. You can feel it in the air. You got your dogs ready for a UP trip? Well, you know what? This Friday, I plan on taking a day off, and I'm going to make my first trip, finally. I can't believe I've not been up there. But uh, now we've got a trip planned for the middle of October, but I need to go up there and get some tuning started and get the dogs acclimated to for some long days and, and a long 10, uh, 10 days, I guess. But uh, So, yeah, hopefully this weekend I can get, make my first trip up there. Yeah. Well, heck, we're we're still trying to catch up a little bit from this past weekend. Like you said, we just got back from the Coonhound World Championship, and I had a blast. Oh, man, so did I. You know, Saturday or uh, Sunday night, we got home pretty late. You and I and, and Kyle rode together. The girls rode separately, but we didn't get home till way, way late. And I actually stayed up for a little while and looked at a little bit of the footage from the weekend, you know, down there. We kind of, or I at least, didn't look a, at a whole lot of what was on our social media platforms, but I looked a little bit when I got home, and I didn't get to bed until about 2 o'clock. And I tell you, Monday here I, at the office, I was still dragging. So last night when I got home, uh, Monday night, I went. I was in bed by 7.30, and I still wanted to sleep in this morning. <laughs> yeah. Hey, honestly, by the time we, we got there Tuesday night, uh, Wednesday was basically an all-setup day, and that was kind of our last – calm night starting on Thursday afternoon it was kind of uh, all out all the way till Sunday morning and uh, I guess when you're there at an event you don't realize how be you're sitting around waiting for deadline times and waiting on it to get dark but when you're when you're working an event time can get away from you pretty quick there's always something to be done yeah you know but the biggest thing I still go back to how hot it was on Monday and Tuesday you know Tuesday was we saw 102 on in the on the thermometer in the truck one time on uh no, Wednesday. Was that Wednesday? Wednesday. You're right. Wednesday. And then Thursday, you know, they were predicting it was supposed to cool off. And it did, you know, down to the low 70s. How lucky were we? That's a, that's a big difference between 170 degrees. And it sure made for a better event oh. for the hunters and the hounds. Could have got dangerous pretty quick if it, those high temps would have yeah, kept. And how, yeah, that was, that was pretty nice, though. Yeah. Hey, well, uh, this, this episode is going to be all about uh, Coonhound World Championship. And I figure the first place to start out is kind of just a – Talking about what led up to the event and talking about the event itself before we get into some some pretty neat interviews we have. I assume this is going to be a multiple part uh, world championship podcast like our Autumn Oaks coverage, but people really seem to like that. And so we took the, the podcast gear along and got to talk to a lot of quality people. Yeah, I I, uh, I talked to several good folks and, and I know you did as well. So uh, hopefully we can maybe put a bonus episode or two in this whole package. But yeah, it was, it was just a good world hunt and and uh, what an exciting week we've had. Yeah, so so the World Championship is something that starts all the way back in January of this year uh, so with our regional qualifying events that we have all over the country. And we've kind of talked about uh, the World Championship and how it works and stuff, but let's talk some numbers. People like to hear numbers and, and some overview stuff. So like I said, RQEs got started there in, uh, in January, and we had uh, around 170 RQE hunts this year. Um, and about 180 bench shows. Obviously, there's a few more bench shows, so we do some uh, bench show only type of events where you can qualify. Uh, just just turns out to be good. Mm -hmm. um, we had just right around 3,000 dogs enter into the RQE hunts over the year, uh, with 740 ish dogs getting qualified. Um, and in the bench show side of things, had almost 1,200 entries into the RQEs with 680 dogs getting qualified. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we always know that when a when a finals is going to 
Tennessee. It's not going to be uh, our numbers aren't going to be as high across the RQE landscape as it would be if you're in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, where it's uh, easier traveling for everybody. Or maybe they're talk, they're thinking uh, the hunt conditions and stuff like that. But I think we're pretty pleased with the overall numbers here. I think we should be. You know, uh, overall, I think uh, it, was, it was very good, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, moving forward, obviously, the hunters uh, go straight to the zone events, and that ended up happening September 16th and 17th this year. Yeah, you just you talked about uh, qualifiers, you know, to go back. They start at the beginning of the year, January 1, yeah. uh, and they end at the end of August. We don't schedule any qualifiers uh after the end of August, and obviously that has to do with the, the deadline of uh, September 4th, which is always the Saturday of Autumn Oak. So, yeah, January through August. Yeah, and then and to go into that zone weekend, we ended up having 485 uh, zone entries, mm -hmm. which is, uh, it's fair. It, it's it's a Southern, a Southern World Championship year, so we know that uh, 485 entries across our seven zones. Uh, and let's just give those guys a shout out again, the zones who who put in a lot of work to make this stuff happen. And they had some really good hunts. And you know what? I've heard the hunters talking about this last weekend about their zone experiences, you know, and obviously these, the folks that we talked to are the ones that advance. So obviously that's, uh, that's all good. But I heard a lot of good come from uh, reports uh, on behalf of the zones this year again. Yeah. Well, Hey, the, the main, the main name of the game at the zones is to score coons, no dead cast advance to the next round. And of the 214 casts that were in the woods on uh, on Friday and Saturday night of the zones, 198 came back with a plus point cast winner. Only 16 dead casts over two nights and seven zones across the country. That's pretty incredible, and that's that's hard to beat right there. Yeah, not bad at all. Right. Um, uh, zone one was in Brooklyn, Wisconsin, and it was kind of hosted by the Pecatonica River Valley Coon Hunters. Uh, zone two, Mercer, Pennsylvania. Western Pennsylvania Coon and Fox Hunters Association. They put on that event, and they actually they had no dead cast for the whole weekend. First time we've kind of used uh, Mercer. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's been in Brooklyn, Wisconsin, Argyle area back yep. in my first year here, but yep. for Mercer, Pennsylvania, that was kind of their first time hosting a zone. They did a great job. Yeah, I don't know when you want to. We've got some cutoff scores here for each one. You know, Brooklyn, maybe as we go along here, oh, uh, yeah. may mention that 475 was the cutoff to advance to the finals, you know, out of the Brooklyn zone. That's great. That's good hunting there in, in southern Wisconsin, you know, ba basically right there on the Illinois-Wisconsin line. But it's uh, we've been in that area before and, and have always done good up there. But so, yeah, score of 475, single night cast win. And that's uh, – That's tough. That, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a fair score too. Yeah. Mercer, uh, just below that, uh, Mercer, Pennsylvania, 350 for the cutoff there in Mercer, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Zone three was in Bryan, Indiana. They had a uh, Limber Lost Coon Hunters Club uh, hosted that one, uh, and they did also. They also did a great job. They had the biggest, the biggest zone uh, just by sheer numbers. Fifty three cast, uh, fifty three plus point cast winners. No dead cast there over the weekend. For that's pretty guys. incredible. You know that's great hunting, but really, even then, you know, you can have dead casts anywhere. Yeah. You know, we always kind of think, you know, in the southern states you have, and and that's and that's true. You know, but even in some of the northern states where they have more game than in other places you can still easily have dead cast but that is that's pretty incredible yeah, like and, said, and there again the cutoff score of 350 plus one night score is that's that's good it's good mm -hmm. uh zone four marion county cooners association in palmyra missouri a place where we there's been major events of uh before they've hosted major events and they did a great job that weekend they, had 53 yep. cast uh, 206 dollars over the weekend only two dead casts in Palmyra. That's, that's, again, that's incredible. That's really good. I've hunted there myself, been to zones, you know, before I worked here and, and have some vivid and fond memories of being at the Palmyra zone there. They had the finals there too, but I think I told the story about playing tennis down yeah. there with the, with the local high school coach that just yeah. smoked our behinds, you know, playing tennis over there at the courts there by the fairgrounds. But yeah, there's a, that's a good area to hunt though. Uh, zone five in Pilot Mountain, North Carolina, the Sara Town Coon Hunters Club put on that event. Um, and they, they did an awesome job as well. They had probably more dogs than any of the Southern uh, zones did. And, uh, they did a great job putting the dogs in the woods and quality hunting. Mm -hmm. 200, uh, 200 plus for a cutoff score to advance there for a one night score out of there. Yeah. I'm only, only four dead casts out of 28 there yep. in Pilot Mountain, which is still good. And when you say that, that's over two nights. Yeah, that's right. Very good. Um, Clarksville, Georgia. I was excited to put it in Clarksville. They have a strong club at the Habersham County Coon Hunters Association, the Kastners and those guys. They've been yep. talking to us for the past few years at Grand American and 
automotive and different events and they wanted to try something like this zone and i was glad we were able to get it there for them yeah and good guys too and they've they've been good to work with and that that cutoff was two and a quarter there for the clarksville zone yeah hey the clarksville georgia zone their entry was among the lowest uh and we were kind of surprised by that with the with the world championship being in I low know, but I know. clarksville georgia to to dyersburg tennessee that's not a that's not as close as somebody might think Georgia to Tennessee is yeah. still about a eight hour drive from there. Obviously we have a field rep not far from Clarksville and that's a lot of miles. Right. And, uh, well, where we were there in Dyersburg, that's on the Western far Western side of Tennessee, you know, Tennessee is stretched out, you know, from East to West. It's right. not from North to South. It's not that far, but East to West is a different story. So yeah, it's, that's still a good little distance. Yeah. And then uh, the last zone, Zone 7, uh, Queen City, Texas, the Cass County Coon Hunters and Dog Hunters Association there, uh, they had a, a pretty strong entry this year for those guys. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know Josh Howard and some of those uh, guys down there at that club, and we've had the zones down there before. I remember the year we had the finals in Louisiana. We had uh, That was one of our uh, uh, zones that had one of the, uh, the, str- or the largest numbers. They had over 200 that year, you know, so. Uh, Jeez. But, yeah, that's. But, you know, I heard some of the guys talking that down there that it was tough this year, dry conditions, and it was it was tough. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and two and a quarter cut off there. One thing that uh, the, as much bad things that came out of the COVID year, one of the good things is it got our zones kind of on a schedule where they're all in the same uh, same schedule and circulation. So every two years we're going to plan on changing these zones. So uh, you can go ahead and uh, kind of bank as long as these clubs. I've talked to all these clubs and they're interested in hosting it again. We didn't have any issues there. Uh, like we talked about, they did a great job getting dogs in safe hunting and where they were able to score on coons and uh, probably going to be at the same exact places like next year. That sounds sounds good. But, yeah, you're right. I haven't heard really anything negative or, you know, that uh, that we should have any concerns as far as much of anything. So, yeah. So fast forward fast forward one week. We had, uh, we had one Monday to kind of get all of our stuff together from the zones, uh, gather up lists and get materials together and – post lists and all that good stuff before we headed out early Tuesday morning for Dyersburg, Tennessee. Uh, we hit the road. We uh, drove all day Tuesday, set up all day Wednesday, and we started the world championship on Thursday. Yeah, you know, I, and I got the question down there a couple times, and it's, uh, you know, folks asking, how does how do you plan or how do you decide on where you're going to go or how much planning goes into it or, or this and that, you know. And, and in this one, we probably talked about going here probably longer than most, but I can tell you, we started talking about it, you know, three, four years ago already with then president of the Black and Tan Association, Chad Smith, about going to Dyersburg. So I think the first time we went and actually looked at the facility where they might be an option to hold it was there in 2019 on the way down to the Winter Classic, you and I and one of the other staff members stopped in there. So that would have been in February and we looked at this facility, you know, so yeah, just to, you know, Talk started probably in uh, in 2018 already, uh, you know, but uh, made it uh, finally made it happen for 2022. Yeah, you know, talking to Chad when we were down there, he talked about how they're a part of the country that has is pl- has tons of coon hunters in that area, but most of the year, right being right there off the Mississippi River, they're flooded. Yeah. A lot of their timber, huntable yep. timber, is flooded. And he's talking about how uh, September, after the summer's come and gone, a lot of that stuff dries up, and that's mm-hmm. when they have mm-hmm. lots and lots of rooms. Mm-hmm. for big hardwood bottoms for coons to score coons on yeah i guess i didn't realize how dry he was talking about <laughs> yeah <laughs> no I, I think talking to him they're like in a 30 or 40 year drought down there right now so they're they're yeah. kind of hurting for rain right now yeah. but uh still and we, it was kind of felt this last weekend a little bit you know i think uh they have a pretty good game population you know good coon population there but the dry conditions made it made it tough you know uh but it was it was still a good a really dang good hunt. This podcast is brought to you by the all-new Dogtra Pathfinder 2. Dogtra, the official GPS collar partner of UKC. Yeah, so heading into Dyersburg, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, dogs qualifying for the bench show, and there's no zones for the bench show dogs. You qualify at a regional qualifying event by winning one of the six categories, you advance straight to the finals. And that's what we had here. We had uh, 125 dogs entered into the the Ben Show finals here. And actually, of you know, usually we talk about there's always a percentage that doesn't come. I actually had 100 dogs show on Saturday. Yeah, and that's pretty good. You know, on uh, Thursday or Friday already, uh, before the show, I met this one couple from Maine. 23 hours they drove there, 23 hours, and showed a, they had one red bone qualified. And I got talking to that fellow, and uh, 
it was it was it was interesting you know because that's it was he's it was a hunting dog it's his cat dog hunts bobcats with the dog you know and that's his that was his one of his top hunting dogs you know and that was pretty interesting you know he didn't win in the show but man it was it was good to see people like that that uh, have you know take pride in qualifying their dogs and very nice dog too you know but uh, uh come all the way and come that far that's that's so cool nothing to hang your hat over the hundred of the top dogs in the country there and we only had a handful of winners a lot of people that didn't win but yeah. that's the best part of it getting out there and meeting people like you mm-hmm. seeing people who who enjoy competing with their hound, mm-hmm. hounds getting out there and seeing some of the top dogs in the country and hey let's measure my hound up against yours absolutely absolutely yeah. so uh had a hundred dogs and man the building there at dyer county on saturday morning it was pretty full it was it was a good crowd yeah and and it got warmer on friday it was cooler on thursday than friday and i turned the air conditioning up just a little bit because i was afraid it was gonna get too hot with all those folks in there you know it was the building was full like you said but yeah. that air conditioner worked great and it was very comfortable matter of fact i saw a few ladies put their jackets on <laughs> Yeah, well, I, hey, I uh, I kind of uh, slept through the the first part of it. I waited till you guys got all the work done, and then I came in just to enjoy the show and to talk to people. But yeah. uh, we we had a, a couple of top judges there this year. People who are very people in the sport are very familiar with them. They both done a pile of winning. Uh, our early round judge, Miss Lori Galbraith. Yeah, from from Arkansas. You know, she's judged for us at the Winter Classic. I think was her first major assignment for us, as far as any of our. UKC uh, shows goes, but she did a great job there at the Winter Classic, and I think she was a a good pick. She does a a thorough inspection evaluation of of every dog, and I think every participant should have uh, felt that uh, she did a good, fair evaluation of everyone's dogs. You know, and uh, yeah, yeah. And then uh, when we got down to the later rounds and the finals, uh, Mr. Valen Nelson took over the judge and assignment and picked our world champion. Yeah. So uh, in the first round, you know. Um, Lori Galbraith, she selects a one male of every breed and one female of every breed. And then in the uh, later rounds, when Val Nelson comes in to do the finals, uh, his first class is the seven male breed winners that Lori Galbraith had selected. So that's his first class to uh, choose a dog, uh, one male from. And then the same thing with the females. And then his final class is one male against one female. So, and you know, uh, Val Nelson, he's judged a lot of shows. He's a He's from Joplin, Missouri, um, and back in the day, he's had some. He's had a lot of dogs over the years, you know. But back in the day, he had a female war bonnet, Miss Tammy, I think was her name, uh, that uh, won a lot of shows. And uh, he knows what a what a good dog looks like and and how to evaluate dogs. But yeah, so he had that. Uh, he had the job of of picking the next world champion. Yeah, he's. He's one of those guys who's kind of transitioned over to Beagles now, it seems. He's actually won a couple uh, Beagle World Show champions over in that, and that kind of makes it good for him coming back into the scene. He's not as familiar with the people that are showing, and he's just, you know, he's, he's got a clear mind. He's got a blank slate, and he's seeing these a lot of these dogs for the first time. Mm-hmm. And that's true, yeah. So he, he actually won one of our Beagle World Shows with, at the time, was Adi Burke, who is also a coonhound guy. You know that he kind of did both uh, coonhounds and beagles, you know, and was uh, was big into shows and 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 show and showing his dogs and everything. But he sh- showed uh, Val Nelson showed up one of Adi Burke's dogs and won the Beagle World Show when we had it in Missouri several years ago. And then this last year he came back with a, uh, I think it was a, a daughter off of that same dog that Val owns, and and he won it again with that dog. So yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't get to see some of the uh, the first round uh, Ben Show stuff, but when I got there and saw the later round um, and some of the breed winners, it was obvious Lori did a good yeah, job. What well, a lineup of dogs for the males and females coming back. Yeah, you know, the, the show takes place on Saturday morning, so Friday is a long day for us. And you being the Coonan Programs manager, you're out there for the, you know, two rounds early and late, you know, so... I don't know what time you got out of there on on Saturday morning, you know, but it had to be daylight probably. Yeah, that's almost so, peaking up. So yeah, you needed to sleep in a little bit, you know. I I got a couple hours of sleep, so but yeah, it was early that uh, the area the the building was buzzing and and uh, it was a good a good morning a good day there for the show on Saturday. Yeah, so we got got the seven male seven males in there, and uh, he chose the black and tan uh, as as his male breed winner. 
Uh, that's uh, Grand Champion 2, Confirmation Grand Champion, Deep South Tailgates and Tan Lines. It's a six-year-old male uh, owned by Madison Fancher of Alabama. Yeah, that's dog. I first saw that dog several years ago, and the dog was barely two at the time. So it had to be four years ago already, probably, and that's longer than I would have thought. But I remember at the Winter Classic, I was up in the hunt office. You know how it is. We don't get to see much of the show because we're working up there. But I remember going down on the arena floor. And I, it was at the, at the show was over, and there were still a few folks taking their pictures. But I see this one black and tan, and he did catch my attention. I even asked somebody sitting there. I think it was Mr. Ford from Alabama was there, and I said, I told him I made just commented, boy, that's a nice black and tan right there. And he said, well, it just won the show, and that, and it was this dog. But I remember looking at it, and it was like, wow, that dog is that dog's going to do some winning, you know, just looking at him. And honestly, I was surprised it might not have, uh, I'm not surprised at all to see the dog win this show at all. You, you know, the cool thing about, uh, about this one is I saw Madison um, is also the breeder on record um, for this dog. Uh, obviously, the sire of it is Margarita Lucky Old Son. That's a dog that a lot of people are familiar with. It won Automote right. twice. Right, it did. And the only dog to win it twice, I think, in the show. Am I, I'm, don't hold me to that, but. And then on the bottom side, Deep South Sunset Celebration, another confirmation champion, Grand Champion 3, a dog that's competing in a lot of events. I assume Madison must own that dog as well and must have done some winning with it. Yeah, you know, the dog is, is bred. Now, you know, anything off that lucky old son, you know, he, he, even even at, a, at an older age, that dog competed for about as long as any dog has in the shows and was still very competitive, just a strong dog. And, you know, this being a direct offspring right here, you know, just a, a, a super nice dog for sure. Yeah, and you're starting to see pups out of him that are really showing up in the winter. Oh, I, I say he's now starting to. Dogs like Doc Holiday and and Dave Meyers have been winning out of him for a while now. Mm -hmm. But you know, this is another just just shows what a reproducer he is as well as far as uh, throwing dogs with the correct confirmation. Yeah, build. and and you know, like a lot of folks that win this show, you know, it's a hard thing to do. It's 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 not a gimme by any stretch. You know, it's it's a hard hard thing but just the emotions that you saw at the end you know with with that young lady it's uh man how sweet that's got to be yeah she was overwhelmed with emotions absolutely she was you know the hard work they put into it we we talk about the night hunt guys you know do a lot of hunting but i can assure you these folks also put in a lot of time a lot of practice getting their dogs ready having them in the ultimate shape you know tip-top shape you know, when they bring them to the shows and, and, and they have to, you know, if they don't, somebody else's, their competitors are going to have that, you know, and, and, uh, uh, she was just overwhelmed with, uh, with emotions and joy, obviously. Sure. Sure. And, and I actually, uh, I, I interviewed her after on the, one of the, in the podcast afterwards. And even then still an hour later, she was still just overwhelmed with, yeah. with emotions. It takes but, a while for that one to yeah, sink in. Yeah. It sure does. Yeah, you can imagine but, but that's that's so cool yeah and then uh so after selecting her or sorry after selecting uh they call him chevy as the the male yeah, the male yeah, winner yep. they brought in the seven females and another black and tan uh grand champion two melrose mountain lead me home a uh, seven-year-old black and tan female owned by lisa and shane bedingfield in north carolina took home the the female side of it yeah you know it that doesn't happen too often where the judge will pick two dogs of the same breed. Cause often I would think, I would think when, when the judge selected the black and tan male, I would think that Lisa as a handler probably thought this yeah. is her chances in the female side. Uh, her odds probably dropped. I would think. I had the same thought in my mind. I, I see her going in the ring first. And I was like, Man, that has to be a little bit deflating. Yeah, a little bit, you know. But it just goes to show that Valen Nelson was not afraid to uh, select the dog that he thought was the best in that class, regardless of anything else. Right. You know. So, uh, um, but yeah, another another one where not only was Lisa the owner and showing the dog, but she's also the breeder on record for this uh, lead me home female. Um, I see that it's out of another dog that she's had a lot of success with on the bottom side there. The dam of, of Lead Me Home is a uh, grand champion, Melrose Mountain, Amazing Gracie, who... Who won this very, this very, uh, 
placement in the bench show before, you know, Gracie did. And, and she's, she's won this three times within this family of dogs that she has the opposite sex at the world. And, and how, in, how incredible she's incredibly proud and has a lot to be, you know, j just speaks of her own breeding program, you know, raising breeding and raising her own dogs like this. And to have that type of success at this level is good for them. Yeah. Good for them. I don't like to admit very much that I make mistakes, but I did make a mistake in a in a previous episode. And me and Lisa, I had a chance to interview Lisa afterwards, and we we kind of laughed about it because I texted her right after me and you got done uh, doing a, a podcast talking about the top 10 bench show standings mm -hmm. where we talked about this lead me home female right here. She's in the top 10 bench show standings. And I said that she had been opposite sex at the world. But it, in fact, it was her litter mate brother who had wanted a couple or who had got opposite sex a couple years prior. Yeah. And now it turns out it ended up happening. I asked her, are you mad or happy that this happened? <laughs> Matt, I won the yeah. whole thing if I didn't jinx you maybe, but, uh, it brought them both back. And as we've kind of alluded to the male brought back the male and female, both black and tans. And yeah. the male was, the, was the winner that day. Yeah. And you know, and, and you're right. I kind of jumped uh, ahead a little bit there and, uh, you know, to, to say that the, the male was the winner, you know, which everybody knows anyways by now, but, uh, you know, going back here to, uh, uh, lead the lead me, uh, lead me home dog, Lisa's dog. Uh, the top side of that dog's pedigree, I'm not that familiar. Matter of fact, I'm not familiar with it at all. You know, but the bottom side, there's that Beaujolais, that Shawnee Hills Beaujolais dog. That was a super nice dog. Did a lot, a lot of winning back in the day. And that's what Gracie is off of, uh, which is the dam to lead me home. Uh, but so that's just a, that's just a, a fan or a, a tree of, of some really nice dogs in that in that uh, breeding right there. So kind of what stood out to me is on the top side here. It's actually got a, a this the grandsire of this lead me home is a a grand knight champion mid year on black bar. It doesn't have a show title, has a hunt title. Mm -hmm. Kind of shows that these people aren't afraid to make those necessary crosses right. to get in their dogs what they have to have. And uh, it goes again to show you Shane and Lisa. They they want a dual purpose style hound. They want a dog that can can uh, you know tree cones in the woods, but also, uh, has the function and, uh, and confirmation to win in the bench show as well. Yeah. You know, and, um, and, and I think we're seeing more of that these days than we may have at one time. And that's, and that's good to see. I think, you know, they, they are, they are coon hounds and, and, uh, and a lot of these dogs, you know, I was talking to Lee Kearns the other day, you know, and he was talking about that. And if you'd be surprised, um, for somebody that has been as successful as he has both in hunts and, and in the shows, Lee Kearns from South Carolina, he told me that in his lifetime, he's only ever raised around seven or eight litters. I would have wow. never thought that, you know, and he only bred dogs uh, basically for his own use and his own purpose, you know, but that, uh, and he was talking about, you know, all of his dogs are hunt. First and foremost was hunt, you know, and, and uh, that's, and, and that's interesting, you know, and, and going back to, uh, you know, we did the live stream in the uh, uh, on Saturday night in the final cast. So we played. They played some of the uh, the show stuff that happened earlier that day. You know, on Saturday, the semifinals and down to the finals and everything. And Steve Burkholder is one of the the color commentators on there, and he was talking about uh, right after that segment. Rand came back and he talked about the night hunts, how confirmation uh, in dogs is in fact important. You know, and he made some very good points about that um, to where a lot of these guys that do hunt hard and compete hard have figured that out, that it take and the way he put it, I thought was, was exactly right. You know, you can have a dog that is kind of poorly made, that has a lot of ability maybe, but the point that he made is oftentimes those dogs last maybe a year or two, and then they're kind of broke down and can't handle it anymore. Absolutely. And some of these better dogs that are, you know, older five, six year old dogs that are still strong on the competition circuit. Guess what? A lot of them uh, are only able to do that for that length of time because of their good, strong confirmation. Yeah. So Thursday we got into Dyersburg and uh, let's talk about the hunt a little bit. Uh, we had 104 dogs advance to our uh, our finals and all 104 showed up. That's the first hurdle. Yeah, uh, we were able to cut them into 26 uh, casts of four dogs and send them to the woods. And we didn't have any trouble doing that. Yeah. The one thing I like that we started doing at the TOC this year is when those guys confirm on Thursday, they come up to confirm their entry with dog in hand is we have uh, the cast uh, 
cards are that they draw from for their cast right away. And in, in other words, you have three no, or four number ones, four number twos, all the way down through cast 26, and they draw them. They stick them on a card right away, and by the time they're all confirmed, all the casts are drawn. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you have a few people come up to you afterwards. You know, they drew their buddy and stuff. Hey, you drew it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Two guys uh, from Georgia, uh, Curtis Todd and his buddy, they rode together. Yeah, rode together to the zones and then come to the finals and they draw each other. I hate it. Same I know. for a couple guys from Pennsylvania, drew a, drove a long ways and and draw each other and. Uh, yeah, and you know they come. Right? It's kind of cool how they you know form a lineup they come around they get their or they get their photo taken for the zone photo and everything and then but they're just before they get their phone or photo taken the local club had the guides all set up and had everything already uh pre-assigned who's going to guide cast one all the way down through 26 and the guys could kind of see the little notes they had on who's guiding and maybe kind of where they're going a little bit so that was cool now let's drop the anchor right there for a second yeah. chad smith uh the whole the surrounding clubs in the area Man, what a job they did. Outstanding. Just uh, so uh, organized they yep. were. Yeah, yep. They knew the guides they were using. They even had some extras always for the guides. And, uh, and man, they took it serious. They did. You know, and I've done a bunch of world hunts over the years, obviously, and worked with some great uh, coordinators, guide coordinators for the world hunt. But I don't think we've, you know, uh, we can... <laughs> we're not over-exaggerating, I don't think. You know, but just you could see it the the uh the effort they put in the meetings they had with their guides you know you'd see him back in the corner with all their guides he had his board up there making little notes and all the all the little details outstanding job by chad and his whole crew yeah and just it, it, it meant a lot to him to have the ukc world finals in west tennessee first time it's ever been out there we talked yep. about that it's been in east yep. and central tennessee a few times it meant a lot to those coon hunters out there it meant a lot to the surrounding area you could tell the mayor was there he was there for the whole world hunt he, he was, was dressed up as one of us just going around he's a he's a coon hunter himself he has coon hunt heritage in his family and yeah and if you had known supportive. he would look just he mixed right in with everybody else you would have had no idea he's the mayor you know yeah, felt so welcome. He was excited, wasn't he? He was he was pumped up. <laughs> you know, I told him that he wanted to speak a little bit. You know, that was, uh, and we wanted him to. Uh, you know, so when I first went up there to uh, do the prayer and stuff for the dinner that we had that night, he came up. He thought he was going to talk right. I said, we're not quite ready yet, you know. <laughs> he was ready to, he was ready to welcome the hunters. I'm telling you, he couldn't wait. Man, that was good stuff. Yeah, just, I yeah. just felt so welcome there. Yeah, that was it was good stuff. And what a crowd on Thursday too. Man, it was a great crowd. Uh, one of the bigger crowds of just people traveling with them, and uh, and uh, we drew out cast uh, great. And I know Tuesday uh, going down, I was I was pretty stressed about the whole judge situation. Like we talked about West Tennessee, it's uh it's far away from most of the events that we carry, and far away from a lot of the judges that we use uh, consistently. If, if we're in Indiana, if we're in Ohio, if we're in Kentucky, if we're in East Tennessee, uh, you know, a pile of people there to, to call on to judge for us. But West Tennessee was uh, was a uh, it was a struggle for for me uh, specifically. Uh, I, I struggled with it. And uh, the host clubs and surrounding areas there did an awesome job getting judges as well, taking some of the pressure off of us. Yeah, for sure. And it's always that way. I think you and I have had that conversation. I used to be the same way. You know, we only have a couple days to to get that all put together. And you always have some that, that don't work out, you know. And, and, man, we couldn't be more appreciative of those that do commit to it and help us out with it. Uh, we cannot thank them enough. Yeah, they, and I, only only if if you're in in our position, I think you you don't know until you're in that position and and how hard that can be sometimes. And some of these guys that help us out, man, we're so we're we ha and we have a lot of good guys that year after year that help us out. Yeah, we both have a list a list of judges here, and man, look at the variation of where some of these people are from. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, there, there's guys that guy like uh, Troy Salyers that brought him down all the way from Greencastle, Indiana area. A guy who uh, comes to a lot of our events. He uh, he uh, obviously helps us judge in Greencastle and Autumn Oaks if we yep. need him to with the world. And he came down and all the way from Indiana. So guess what? We used him the whole weekend. We we rode him and it tried to make it worth his while a little bit. Yeah. Jeremy Purvis from uh, Mississippi is one we called just in the last day or two. And he brought uh, Bobby Gates with him, uh, you know, in – Wow. You know, we need, we need, we need, and we're, we're lucky to have guys like that, that will come and help us out, you know, and they, it wasn't like they're just living the next County they're They had a good four or five, six hour drive to get there. So. 
and we Montana Buffington. I almost didn't recognize him. He used to have the long hair and everything else, and I knew he looked familiar, but uh, it took me a little bit to figure out that was Montana. I called a bunch of East Tennessee guys. I was able to get a couple of them to make the drive over. Still a long drive, four or five hours for these guys. Absolutely. Like ben yeah. Bell and Craig Sweeten came over and helped us a little bit. Yep. Um, Brandon Scalf, uh, Kentucky. Man, we've used him several times. A good, solid judge. Used him in the finals, but wow. Yeah, yeah. lucky. And and then there's a, a bunch of guys who, who I met for the first time there. I knew of them, was, you know, friends up with them. Guys like Brandon Barry and his son, Brantley Barry. And, uh, uh, you know, I've seen guys like Mason Bush, who does the Coon Hunt University yep. podcast. Yep. You hear of those guys. Yep. And, and Tom Frost, a guy a guy from Texas that no, I, we no. talked. No, he's from Oklahoma. Oklahoma, okay. Yeah. I talked to him on the phone all the time. First time I've ever met him in person. So it's, They gutted him. <laughs> they, he, he judged on Friday night, and and he was he was pretty tired. Even Saturday, he was sitting there in the chair Saturday night there, uh, slept, I think, through most of the live stream stuff. Yeah. If I, he tells anybody he watched the live stream live, he's He lying. didn't watch much of it. <laughs> <laughs> he was snoozing, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, and also just be remiss not to mention guys like Tommy Brown, who drove to and from Arkansas both nights. Yeah, uh, Tommy has been in, Tommy has been in the in the finals top one hundred the last couple of years. Didn't make it this year, but came over to help us judge. Thank you, Tommy. And then uh, uh, Ronnie Stark, he was there with uh, Bob Osborne, Timber Creek, uh, mm -hmm. doing some vendor stuff outside, yep. and he helped us judge on Thursday night. Craig Sweeten's another one that has been coming to a bunch of our events in the last several years, and a uh, great guy, and came over, helped us judge, man, appreciate him. And then let's just lift off, list off the local guys who, yep. who I'm not as familiar with, but mm -hmm. got to meet them, and a good quality guy. Yep. Jody Weaver, Taylor Jones, Russell Cawthorn, Rodney Hemby, Jesse Alexander, John Estes, Brett Ross, Chad Smith, Will Kennedy, Chad Hicks, Brian Turner, Jeremy Qualls, and Anthony Simpson. Thank Ab you guys so much. Absolutely. Ab every one of them. Whether they judged one cast or multiple casts, we appreciate every one of them. And and there's some other local guys that uh, would be that would love to uh, judge maybe another round or two and and uh, to to just for the event's sake, we have some other guys that drive a long, long distance, you know, and and uh uh, it helps, you know, if they get that opportunity, you know, and makes it worth more of their trip to get them there. So some of uh, some of the local guys that are willing to to step aside and and uh, you didn't hear any complaining. And it's you know the number one thing we want to have good judges, but uh, what's most important is the overall quality of the event. And and uh, good judges goes a long way in determining that. I value. didn't hear you mention Jody Weaver. I hadn't. I have him on the list here. You may or may not have, but yeah, everybody. Everybody. Yeah. So, hey, let's get into round one real quick. We sent 26 four-dog casts of the woods, 104 dogs, and we had a couple dead casts, but for the most part, they treat coons. Even a couple of the dead casts treat on a, a few coons. We ended up with 23-plus point cast winners. Um, there in the first round, that first night, in 26 casts, they saw 78 coons and scored on 67. Yeah, that's still pretty good. You know, we talked to, you know, it was didn't take long. Cast started coming back, and everybody pretty much had. They were hitting tracks and things like that, but conditions were just dry, 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 and it made it tough. It just did. We just can't control that, you know, but. Cast winners, as they came in, they went right to, to the live show set, and, man, how awesome was that? I absolutely loved what they call it the midnight mayhem uh, yeah. Thursday yeah. and they were they were interviewing cast one winners as they came in Rick Stretch and and Jay Paul and Steve Burkholder yeah. and those guys did yeah. just an awesome job. Was they did and broadcast. that was cool to see every cast winner got to go on there did a did a interview and uh that was all first time we've done that but that was that was a good idea. I'm glad we did it. A Burkholder and Stretch they they do their homework and they know these guys. They do so much talking to people and, mm -hmm. and they learn these facts about mm -hmm. them and it just makes such a quality show to watch. Yep, sure does. Put the homework and, in. And something you can always go back to for a long, long time. That's right. So we advanced to Friday night. Uh, we had 23 dogs on Friday night and we ended up with six casts. We had uh, five four dog casts and one three dog cast and we sent them to the woods um, and ended up with five plus point cast winners at the end of round two. Yeah, on one, of, one of one of my things that I really like on Friday night that we kind of started doing the last couple of years, have a handler's meeting with just the handlers only, kind of set up a, an area to get them up close and kind of go over all the specifics for the hunt and everything. And, and uh, that's a good thing to do. And then we have them, again, draw their own cast there by with a number system. And that video of that cast draw lives on our uh, UKC Coonhounds Facebook page, and it's fun to watch or yeah. revert back to. It yeah. was yeah. well done, and I enjoy seeing that. So, mm -hmm. 
And and on that first round, uh, like uh, they had uh, out of the six cast, five. There was actually one dead cast, so it was five plus point cast winners. But the out of the six casts, they saw sixteen coons scored on eleven, so yeah. they were still in game. Sometimes that's there's still a lot of foliage on the trees, and yeah. they made that cast that was dead made multiple trees, um, and just couldn't find the coons. Yeah, you know, and we uh, we talked about uh, you know the, the format for it, you know, and ideally we would have had uh, six plus point cast winners to go out late, you know, in, in, uh, in heads up. And, uh, but you know, after we lost three casts, if everybody would have had plus points in the first round, we would have had seven casts to go out on Friday in the in round in the first round early on Friday. Obviously that didn't happen, bumped it down to six casts. So that was, you know, we were already thinking, gosh, we hope everybody comes in with plus points so we can have this three casts of heads up competition and, and unfortunately, that didn't happen, you know, and we ended up with five, one, we had one dead cast, so we ended up with five, uh, five dogs, which really kind of, uh, really got us thinking we already were to begin with, you know, but it, it happened where we had five dogs and it, it created, it, it had you and I doing a lot of talking, a lot of thinking. We talked with the reps, you know, first and, uh, what are our best options, you know, and the conditions were super tough. They were just dry. And. It, you know, <laughs> you can, decision-making with things like that is, uh, you have to put a lot of thought into it. And I felt like we really took the time to really think of just everything. And I think we had our heads on straight when we did this and, and, and thought, okay, the worst case scenario that I kept going back to, you and I both kept telling, you know, we have five dogs. If we have and that's two casts, a three-dog cast and a two-dog cast. If one of those casts does not have plus points, the world championship is over. The other cast that had the winner, it's, you know, it, it's done and over with. Uh, we have everything set up for Saturday's live stream that we've advertised. Yes, there is a, a big cost for us that would have never happened, you know, whether we did it or not. Uh, but that's not the main thing. You know, the other thing is if the hunt ends on Friday night, we cannot uh, put these uh, finalists up on a platform that we could otherwise on Saturday. So there's a lot to think about, you know, and I think it's easy to sit back and say, well, that's not what you said, you know, in your handler meeting on, you know, because we talked about that. And the next round is going to plus point cast winner is going to come out and and we'll do uh, uh, three casts of heads up, and those three cast winners advance on to the finals. You know, in worst case scenario, we could have we could have had a two dog final, and that would have been fine. We would have lived with that. But the thought of, or you know, thinking it that was a real possibility, real possibility. And even later, we're talking late round, and the possibilities of having uh, maybe not having plus points is probably even greater. And I think it all really boiled down to. At the end of the day, the one, number one thing was, okay, let's say worst case, case scenario happens. Saturday is going to be too late for us to change anything. Are we then going to kick ourselves for not having considered an, a different option and uh, while we have the opportunity and, and after it's too late? And we stuck our heads together and we decided, we talked with the reps and they all felt uh, that that was the best thing to do. And we decided, you know, okay, we have five dogs left and we can't put them all in. You know, we would plan on a three dog final, but we uh, decided, you know, the best thing to do would be to, uh, an option was to possibly have four dogs in the final and we have five dogs. So somebody has to hunt it off. Somebody has to hunt it off. There's no way around that. And, um, and that would only be two dogs. So we had the handlers, brought them into a meeting, and we wanted this to be a unanimous decision. Otherwise, we were going to go with a three-dog cast and a two-dog cast, plain and simple. Not our decision, their decision. We uh, let them know what the situation was and that, uh, you know, sure, we can, we can put them up on a pedestal on Saturday a whole lot and give them a whole lot more recognition then we can worst case scenario. They don't get that. And I think everybody was in favor of that. First of all, they're they're thinking that they have to there as was, they all had to hunt on late on Friday night. Um and right away they were all they understood it and they were 
in favor of it. There was, I felt like there was one guy that really had to think a little bit more and he, hey, kudos to him. He wanted to make sure he wanted to thought everything through first before he said yay or nay. And there was some healthy discussion in there Absolutely amongst the was. cast members. For sure it was, but they understood it. And I can tell you, they were all for it. That was all in their, actually at that point, it was all in their better interest, really. Their chances of getting in the final, even though it was going to be four dogs, was far greater at that point than than the other way around. Yeah, in this way, you're sending four of the five. You have an 80% chance of going to the finals. The other way, you only got a 40%. Yeah, yeah. Think about it that way. You know, but I think, you know, it's one of those that I think, okay, say what you will, you know, uh, I think we, we kind of w- walked up to a potential situation that uh, – Thinking about this, making a decision, getting those directly involved uh, as part of this decision making here. And like I said, if it wouldn't have been unanimous, we wouldn't have done it. And they understood it. And um, they were, matter of fact, you know, Kurt Ehring was one of the first ones to say, boys, let's do it. You know, yep. you know how Kurt is. Yep. And uh, and it uh, and we did that. So we had we drew, basically drew for three would move on and two would go hunt it off. Yep. You know, so, and of course it's going to be disappointing for two of them that don't get that draw, but, uh, Hey, they, uh, and, uh, yeah. So we ended up Kurt, uh, Kurt with Whitey and, uh, and Bryce Matthews hunting the Jed dog, yeah. the short straws yeah. and, uh, didn't, you know, they, they took it like men and headed to the woods. They did, you know, and, uh, so yeah. And, and it all, it all worked out in the end and, and I, Hey, I gotta say this. You know, you can you can look back and shoulda, woulda, coulda, whatever. They would have all had to hunt regardless otherwise. You know, so uh, really, it was probably in their best interest. It was it should was probably it would be an in, an easy decision for anybody in that position. And and I think in the end, it really all worked out for the best for everybody, including them, even Bryce Matthews. And it's interesting. We have a we have a, I had a, I had a chance to interview him Saturday morning. It's going to be a really interesting interview mm-hmm. for people to listen to from his perspective of it. And uh, I'll leave it at that. You Good. just stay tuned and listen to his. Interview. Good, you know, and I've not even heard that, so I look forward to hearing that. And we talked to him afterwards, and what a positive guy, you know. Good yes. for the sport. Really, we need a whole lot more Bryce Matthews, and we have a lot of Bryce Matthews, but just a good guy in the sport. Uh, on that late uh, round three cast, uh, I guess you could call it with Kurt and Bryce going out with Whitey and Jed. And uh, kind of, if you look at the scorecard, kind of what we were scared of, they were this close to having a dead cast. Uh, they scored on one coon. They made seven trees, and six of them were circle trees. They were that close to being a dead cast. That could have easily happened on a late round, and we could have easily crowned a world champion on Friday night, which was worst-case scenario. But uh, So uh, with uh, with Kurt and, and Whitey winning that round three cast, advancing to Saturday night, we had a four-dog final set. Yeah. And, you know, before we move on, we just touched on Bryce Matthews, that Jed dog he was handling. He started hunting that dog, what, just at Autumn Oaks a couple of weeks ago? Yep. Uh, before this hunt. And he was, he came into the world championship, what, four for four with this dog? Hadn't lost a cast yet. Uh, what was he? Ended up being six for six with it. And the seventh cast he hunted this dog with was uh, the late round on Friday. But what a run. And this this dog has changed hands a few times and and changed hands again uh, at the world championship amidst all of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You're exactly right. Uh, it uh, has a new, new owner uh, the way we understand it as, as they were leaving on Friday night. So yeah, uh, that's just the the way of the dog world. You never know. Yeah. 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 So Saturday night, man, it was time to crown a world championship and that's always just, uh, so exciting to see history made, uh, with another, uh, world champion being crowned and, and this time we had a, a really strong, uh, really strong final four. Uh, well, we obviously had uh, Whitey, who we just talked about, Grand Night Champion Bozo, Stylish Whitey, owned by Kurt Ehring and Buzz Lynch. Uh, we had No Gamble, Put Him to Sleep, owned by Adam Campbell of Georgia and handled by Jeremiah Roller. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Grand Night Champion Bus Row Creek, Creek uh, sorry, Bus Row Creek Hawk, owned and handled by Wyatt Monin, and then uh, Champion Grand Night Champion Two, Get Going Jenna, yeah, owned by Cheyenne Cummings and Tyler Compton, handled by Tyler. Yeah, and man, what a final cast! You know, there's we're not going to take a whole lot of time here, but um, uh, folks should go watch the live stream again. That lives on YouTube, uh, but they covered uh, that final cast very well. But those those four guys right there, uh, friends, they're uh, three. Of, they all knew each other. 
uh, but uh, several of them, pretty close friends, you know, and and I saw a lot of things in this world championship, and the guys talk about that. You know, they talk about the guys coming back on Friday night that didn't win their cast in the early round, and then just the uh, camaraderie there uh, while they're waiting, you know, for us to place them in the top 20 and everything. It was, you know, it, the world hunt is is – it's a big deal. And it's, there's always disappointments, you know, that is so close, but, and that's, that's what the world championship is. It is a hard, hard hunt to win, you know, but just seeing those guys on Friday night, all sitting around and, and joking and laughing and talking about their hunts and this and that, that's, that is the epitome of the sport right there. And that's, that's what the sport should be. And kudos to all those guys, you know, yeah. it, it's, um, uh, and then those these same with these guys moving into the to the finals. You know, you saw I have I have never I don't think I've ever seen, and not that it's never happened, but at the end of it, the all the handlers in the cast getting a picture with Tyler Compton and the and the and the winner. Yeah. Very cool stuff. Very good stuff. It was very good stuff. Good it was stuff. a very smooth hunt. And like and like you said, uh if you want to see all the details of the hunt, then be sure to head over to the United Kennel Club YouTube channel. Uh, both of those videos, a video from Thursday night where we interviewed the cast one uh, winners and the final cast play by play are both still on there. Obviously, they're going to be on there. Uh, and and as we're sitting here talking, Thursday night has uh, get it's creeping up on six thousand views, and that Saturday night final cast play by play actually has twelve thousand views. That's pretty incredible. And you some, know, yeah, some members of the media team actually said that there were points of time during the Saturday live show where we had our highest audience. Uh, concurrently watching yeah. at the time yet yeah. out of all of yeah. our live shows. And in that final cast, you know, and like anything all the way up through the, through the uh, finals uh, of the world championship, you know, it takes breaks. You get, there's good breaks and there's bad breaks, just like any other event. And sometimes you got to get the breaks and, you know, a couple dogs got out of pocket a little bit. They stretched out a little bit, but man, Jenna's performance that night. Wow. Sometimes you have a hunt like that where it just seems like a dog cannot, and will not be denied on that night, that given night, you know. Um, and it seemed like it was that type of a night for Jenna, just perfection, no blemishes. Made tree th or made three trees in the final cast, plus on every one of them, six hundred plus for a final score for her. And it's uh, go back and watch the live stream uh, stuff on that and. And the the Steve and and Rick and them they covered uh, a lot of that. They talk about uh, strategies for handlers. You know, sometimes we talk about uh, the best dogs. You know, the rules should be geared to where the best dog always wins. You know, like we said, there's also breaks in it. And I think with the handler aspect, it's a team thing still. And they really stress that, and that's part of what makes it so exciting. You know, there's, you know, they talked about, okay, where, what's Tyler going to do now? Is he going to cut her loose? Is he going to hang on to her? What should you do? And they talked about the different strategies, you know, uh, of this or that, you know, and sometimes you can, that's, that's all part of it really, you know, and, and that's what makes it so fun and so exciting. And, uh, you know, I was talking to Steve after the fact, you know, and sometimes even in the world series in baseball, a team will uh, put a hitter up there to bunt. That's going to be an out. They want to have an out. But to create that out, it gives them some other, it, you know, it's a strategy thing. The same is true for, for some of this, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Just good stuff. And it couldn't ask for a, for a more gracious world champion and somebody to represent our sport than Tyler Compton was. Uh, we got some great content from him. And that's on the live show. You'll see him on our social media platform, some of the interviews that people – different people did. And actually on the podcast, I actually got a chance to sit down with him uh, early, early Sunday morning, about three 30 in the morning while you guys are all breaking down. I got to go up and, and talk to Tyler for a minute. And uh, uh, let's listen to that interview right now. Hey guys, this is Trevor and I'm live Sunday morning at the Coonhound world championship with our brand new 2022 world champion, Mr. Tyler Compton. How you feeling bud? I'm excited. I'm I'm exhausted, but I'm excited. I I couldn't be happier. Long weekend? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's been a long week, long weekend, but uh, it, it, it's worth it. We've made it through here. So yeah, man, it's two thirty-seven now. I think we got back uh, forever ago. You've been in here doing interviews and uh, 
taking pictures and videos and we've had y'all doing all kinds of stuff and now i got you up here on the podcast and you still ain't on your way home yet <laughs> that's all right the, the media team did a great job um props to them props to ukc uh you know i i could go on all day thanking people i appreciate it more than people know yeah uh, so yeah we weren't even out of the woods yet and you said you already had something like 50 text 50 facebook messages 20 text whatever it was yeah i couldn't even start to text them all back i haven't even looked at my phone lately but i'd say there's somewhere around 150 notifications and and uh you know i'm blessed to blessed to have that many people supporting me and and being here with me through all of it and and uh you know i it's it's a surreal feeling but i'm i'm stoked i'm glad it was me i'm glad i'm here uh and uh it is what it is. Here we are. Yeah, kind of a funny story, right? Uh, going back to, uh, I guess we we published the list of the zone entries. So a zone uh, entries closed for the zones on uh, the Saturday at Autumn Oaks. So we posted that list not the ne- not the next Monday, but the Monday after that. And it had to be just within the next couple of days where you noticed that you weren't on the list and you had entered. Yeah. So I think it was probably the next day I kind of keep up with the Facebook page pretty, pretty much. And, uh, I saw it got posted and I was kind of scrolling through there. And of course there's so many dogs entered that you, you sometimes can pass them. And I don't know, I think the first time I went through it, I was like, yeah, okay. Second time I got a little nervous. And by the third or fourth time I, I was texting you and saying, Hey Trevor, what's going on? And and what do you know? I made a mistake and transposed some numbers, and but we got it figured out, and here we are. Yeah, I went to the went to the le- uh, the ledger list that we have and uh, searched your name on there, and they had you down handling, I think, a seven year old plot dog. I think you made the right choice choosing or switching dogs up, though. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I I wouldn't have been disappointed either way, but uh, I sure rather it be Jenna than anything else. So yeah, hey, when you originally called, I know we had just scratched we had uh, just scratched jenna out of autumn oaks uh two weeks before because she was in heat she was just on the tail heat a tail end of her heat cycle whenever we talked on the phone and we actually talked a little bit about maybe doing a refund for her coming in heat and also you weren't sure if you're gonna be able to get off for the zones or not at the time to even hunt and uh there was a lot of inc- uncertainty in the air and you said well just let's hold off i'll see if she's out of heat by this by this weekend if i'll be able to get off work and uh and I guess kind of the rest is history. We've talked about it a little bit. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure when that'll air, but tell us a little bit about that story on the podcast here. Yeah. So we, I, the, the, I work at a bank. I'm, I'm a loan officer at a bank and you know, we're a small town bank. There's a whole six employees there. And, and uh, two, two of the ladies I work with were having grandbabies that week and they needed to take off. And, and I knew that going into the week, there's absolutely nothing that I could do about it. And I understood that's just part of life. You know, work comes before, before hobbies and, I wasn't going to get to go and my boss had been texting back and forth. She was one of them that was gone. And, and, uh, you know, she pulled some strings and the other one that had the grandbaby came in and covered for me for a couple hours. And I was able to get off uh, there just at about two o'clock and it was a six hour drive. So I had my mother and father-in-law go ahead and take her, um, get her to the zones and, and, you know, they got her, they gave her a bath and cleaned her up and, and got her as, as good as we could get for, to hunt her that night. And, um, it worked out. I was able to, Justin Reeves, a good buddy of mine up at, by Adina, uh, got her for me and brought her to the woods. He guided me that night and it, it didn't work out. We didn't win that night, but you know, it was, it allowed me to hunt Saturday night and, and I couldn't be more happy for it. So. Yeah. Uh, Palmyra had one of the higher scoring zones. What'd you get on Saturday to advance? I, I treat two coons and I had 425. Plus. 425. Yeah. I think the cutoff was like 375 or something, or maybe even more than that. Uh, so we get here on Thursday, uh, uh, Jenna, she's here. She's ready to roll. How Thursday night go? Yeah, so Thursday night, um, I felt like I drew one of the tougher casts that we had. Uh, you know, Danny Perez, uh, we pop him up. Woodrow, good dog, uh, good good handler behind him. I also drew uh, previous world champion J.R. Gray. He was hunting a little female called Scar, and she's out of two world champions. Uh, happens to be out of Lane Denny's Emmy female and Willie, of course, a uh, real good dog there. And, um, I don't remember the other, other dog with Walker dog out of Florida. Um, uh, we, we treat, we got in a coon training contest and I tell you, it was the most nerve wracking cast I've ever had in my life because Jenna got treated there at the end of the cast and it would have gave me 300 plus and scar got treated at the same time. And we, uh, we were almost two miles apart when we got treated and I didn't know I'd won that cast because they took so long to score scar for an hour and a half after the cast. Jeez. And, I, I never want to throw up worse in my life because I, I figured for sure Scar had it. And, and, you know, props to JR. There was a coon just, you know, 30 yards from where Scar was treated at. And he sat there the whole time knowing there was a coon down there. And, and uh, you know, there 
obviously he's as honest as they come because he sure didn't try nothing and, and props to him. He told me that night, he goes, you're going to win this. I know it is. No, you are. And, and, uh, he was right. He was the first one that told me that and he was right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so, uh, Thursday night we tried something a little bit different. We had the, uh, the live show stuff going on here, uh, interviewing cast winners as they came in kind of a first time we've tried that a little bit of a different wrinkle. What'd you think about the whole, the whole setup? Have you had a chance to watch any of the live show stuff? Yeah. Um, I've, I've I watched all of it and I love it. You know, the publicity of this, uh, that you guys are doing is awesome. Uh, this from this podcast all the way to the live show, um, they do a phenomenal job, uh, announcing it. Of course, whenever you're not at home watching it, you don't, you don't get to watch as much of it when you're here and, we were all here, all us handlers there in the finals were here watching it when it went live, and it's a super cool deal. You know, this the, we need some positive publicity in the, in the world, and, and props to you guys and props to UKC staff. That's that's what you guys are doing, and, and I think it'll only get better from here. So then we headed into Friday night. You were in the top 23. We had a couple of dead casts. Uh, what, what was your draw like on Friday? Yeah, so Friday night, um, I, I drew a, a buddy from home, Brandon Gaines, hunting Rowdy. And uh, I drew another gentleman out of Texas hunting a blue female, and I got the three dog cast. Uh, that that was a break all in itself that I needed. Uh, you know, Jenna she she traded coon in there for fifty and one hundred and twenty five by herself, and and that's pretty much all that happened. The other two dogs, uh, you know, kind of had some mishaps on some off game, and and uh, that was just it's just a bad break for them, but it worked out for me. And and Jenna is kind of a funny story. She knew something was up because. Right after that, she just quit. She stood in the middle of the road just out of our light for about 25 <laughs> minutes in the cast because I had to hunt my two hours, and and I got done. She come to me and got in the box, and we went on. Um, so it, it worked out. She knew what she was doing. That's right. So uh, fast forward to, to late Friday night. Uh, obviously, we had some dead casts, and we've, we're probably going to talk about it a little bit more in, in the introduction of this podcast, I'd say. Uh, but you were a part of the handlers meet, handler meeting up here with uh, with me and Alan and the field reps. You the five handlers that advanced uh, past the the second round there. And whenever they had we whenever we had the discussion of uh, instead of having a two cast a three and a two dog cast going out and and changing maybe changing it up and instead drawing numbers to do a couple buys and then a couple of uh, uh, heads up casts late to determine the fourth fourth winner and uh you weren't you were one of the first ones to kind of pine in on that what what was your thoughts behind that yeah so um through jenna's lifetime we we've, we've made it in the finals or in the semifinals of some bigger hunts and and had some heads up casts and i think to this time we're oh and four for heads up casts oh for four and we've never won one and that was either good or it was going to be bad i didn't know which and when you let the option to draw for draw for it it obviously was a smart move in my mind because there was only two of us that were going to have to go back out and the rest of us weren't uh you know it's very professionally done you guys kind of had your backs against the wall i understand it completely you know, understood it completely and uh props to you again there you know coming up with stuff on the fly uh, it worked out me and me and jeremiah roller and wyatt actually had had talked about it um all week that hey you know i'd like to see in the finals I'd like to see in the finals well obviously we knew with the dead cast that was going to be impossible because there's going to be a two dog and a three dog and one of us was going to probably draw each other and if not both of us and what do you know we all three draw the one you know i hate it for bryce and and uh, kurt you know we're i'm close with both them too you know we're buddies and and uh, somebody had to take the fall and and they're the ones that kind of got it in that aspect but uh, it's part of it. You win some, you lose some. That was another big break for us because we didn't have to hunt that round, and we were fresh tonight, and and I couldn't be more excited. Yeah, yeah, and it was important that we we had the unanimous decision, and after some some pretty good healthy discussion, we came to the unanimous decision to do that by by all five handlers involved. Uh, so we kind of had a long night last night. Uh, the, today we got in here, um, a long day sitting around, different meetings, getting stuff uh, all checked out and ready for tonight. And then we had the final cast tonight. Kind of walk us through the final cast uh, in your in your uh, perspective. Yeah, so I had in my mind my strategy tonight. You know, um, Jenna, before coming in tonight through the zones and even at the house there, uh, I think she she was she had treed eleven trees and had eleven coons. Um, there hadn't been no dens, nothing. And I decided that it, you know I was going to rely on her to win this cast. It wasn't going to be on me. And uh, we we cut loose and and mine barked just there after the she she left barking and and barked just there after the minute and and I struck her and it wasn't too long and Whitey put in for seventy five and and we were treed I treed for a hundred and a quarter Whitey was there for seventy five and 
went in there and he had a coon. We had a coon together. Um, you know, uh, Jeremiah and Wyatt kind of took a bad break. Their dogs got out of there and they ate, caught them. That's just, that's part of it. Bad part about hunting these dogs that, that are as wild as they are. And, and mine's included that uh, we, so we got recut and, and again, I got struck for a hundred whitey there for 75. And, and luckily, you know, shout out to Wyatt. He, he was able to potentially hear his dog through, through the country there. And he struck and treat his dog and allowed us to walk a little further. And, and it kept me in pocket because mine was getting ready to be out of pocket as well. So when we got to walk out to the field edge, you know, go headed to Wyatt's dog tree. Uh, the two ended up catching him. He, he ended up not being, not being where he was supposed to be. And, and, uh, not, sh- not long after there, I heard Jenna treat and I went ahead and treat her. We went to her and she had her, another coon for another 225, gave me 450. Uh, Whitey would, was still at 150 and, and everyone always asked, well, why'd you recut? Because they thought I should take my handler option and lead to sleepy. But I tell you what, I, I got here on her back and, and I had faith in her and I thought, I know how wide he is with Kurt. He's a, he's a coon trayer. And I thought the last thing I need is him to get in a pocket of coons and, and get me out of my rhythm. So I took a chance. I recut her and you know, what do you know? It was 10, five, 10 minutes. She was already struck and treat again. And there was 40 some minutes left in the cast. We were getting ready to walk plumb away from her. And I thought, you know, why take a chance on, um, being caught, you know, essentially with your pants down, just, just take the, take the chance. And, and bank on her. That's what it's about. And, and so I treated her through there and went through and she had her third coon and that pretty well sewed it up. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Like you cutting loose. Uh, I was surprised me a little bit. I say, but whenever you treat her in, I was, I was thinking that's the guy who trusts his dog and it shows, I mean, it, and it paid off for it. She's a, she's a nice unit for sure. So, uh, so man, what, what a run, what a wild weekend. It's been action packed. It's been a lot of sitting around and waiting. It's been a lot of different things, man. But, uh, uh, any, anything else you want to close out saying? Um, I, you know, I just want to thank everybody. My, my phone has just been, been crazy blowing up. You know, there's support at home, uh, there's support here, uh, my friends, family, everything. This, this is a crazy deal. And probably once in a lifetime opportunity that I couldn't be more excited about. Uh, you know, my buddy Lane Denny, he's, he's right down the road from me. He wanted a few years back and I just dreamed one day it'd be me. And, and here I am. Uh, of course my fo- mother and father-in-law, you know, Jennifer and Cheyenne Cummings, they, they've, done big things for me in the coon hunting world and and you know part of it was getting jenna uh you know then then i want to shout out to the final cast man i couldn't ask for a better group of guys to be with be in there with it uh you know from kurt airing jeremiah roller uh wyatt Monin. i i would have I, I wouldn't have been upset if any of them would have won it it came out that that mine was operating that night you know we hunted tomorrow night it changes the outcome so you know, props to them guys. Congratulations to them. It, it, it takes a team to get here and, and UKC, you know, it takes a team for you guys. Uh, it's, it's a phenomenal event and I hope one day I'm back. I'm sure you will be. You got a lot of hunting left to do, bud. Well, Hey, congratulations again on your world championship and, uh, I hope you have safe travels back home. Thank you, Trevor. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Tyler Compton. Like I said, such a gracious winner, Uh, super, super happy for him. And he's a, obviously he's a big sponsor of ours, the tier one custom calls. And now I guess him and Lane both have UKC world championships. You have to have a world championship to work for these guys or what? I don't, I don't get it, but uh, (laughs) congratulations again to Tyler on his big win. Yeah. And I also had the opportunity to sit down with the other world champion on the bench. So side, uh, Madison Fancher. And like I said, she was so overwhelmed with uh, with joy and emotion. And even an hour later, when I had the chance to sit down with her, and even during her interview, uh, she was still welling up, and and I almost had to cry with her. She was so happy. But here's Madison. So how are you this afternoon? It's I'm, been a special day, uh, huh? Yes, I am speechless. <laughs> so you got to tell everybody what happened here. Well, um, we drove up Thursday afternoon, um, just spent the day here relaxing, just a small vacation. And, um, we come here on today on Saturday and, um, I have a world champion now and it's, it's hard to believe. You're leaving with a world champion Mm -hmm. on your way up here. Did you, did you even, did you even think that, think how that would be? No, I did not. I did not. You're making me tear up a little bit, Madison. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Well, it is. I'm so happy for you. I can tell you, you how happy you are, mm-hmm. but it, it's good to see folks that is just, uh, mm-hmm. wow. It's 
a good day for you, isn't it? Yep. It so is. uh, let's let's talk a little bit. You call him Chevy, right? Correct. So he is what six now? He is. Is he six? What's he out of? First of all, um, he's out of Margaritaville, lucky old son. Okay, um, he's directly off his son. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yep. And his mom is uh, Deep South Sunset Celebration. Um, she's won a little bit, but not near as much as her son has. Yeah. Um, and yeah. his dad, his dad has been one as as much, probably mm -hmm. as much as about any black and tan. That's has right. He's, Casey. Uh, Sonny's known all around, so yeah. he's a good dog. Did you talk to Joe already or anything? Today? Oh my gosh, they're over the moon. Are they? Mm -hmm, they are. <laughs> That's probably, you know, they've won so much with that mm -hmm. dog, and I can only imagine, you know, mm -hmm. being, you know, uh, offspring off of that dog, mm -hmm. how happy they must be for you. Yeah, but, uh, we're all family. Yeah, so mm -hmm. tell us a little bit, what do you do to prepare a dog just like for this show? What what are what is, what are the some of the things that you uh, put a dog through for a show? Um, we get ready with conditioning. Um, first and foremost is coat and muscle. Um, you feed a good dog food that goes a long way uh -huh. and exercise. We exercise every day. Um, we try to run at least a couple of miles a day. Uh -huh. Um, and just overall, just, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, obviously you did exactly everything. He had everything mm -hmm. he needed for this show. Yeah. So. We live on a farm too. So yeah. that helps a lot. They're very active farm dogs as well. Oh, yeah. So yeah. So that helps. have you bred him any or anything or not yet? Um, he's had a few litters, not many though. Yeah. So, so do you expect probably to breed a few females now? I hope so. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get some more puppies on the ground. Yeah. Well, I spoke with uh, Valen Nelson, who judged mm -hmm. him in the final round, and, and I asked him a little. He had a lot of good things to say about <laughs> your dog. So I appreciate it. So, well, I'm not going to hold you up. I know you want to get headed back to Alabama and to mm -hmm. your friends and celebrate and everything, but uh, congratulations again and, uh, and enjoy it. Thank you so much. You deserve it. That's a very nice dog. Thank you. I appreciate it. Congratulations again to Madison on her big win. Uh, shortly after you talked to Madison, I had a chance to talk to our uh, our three-time world bench show opposite sex winner, Lisa Bedingfield, with her uh, Melrose Mountain Lead Me Home dog. Here's Lisa. Lisa, how are you doing? I'm fantastic now. <laughs> doing better now. <laughs> yes, huh? yes. Yeah, so we're here Saturday afternoon, and we just finished up our bench show, and Miss Lisa was just crowned opposite sex world champion for 2022. How's that? How's that got you feeling it's right now? It's pretty incredible feeling. It, and any time that you can win anything above, you know, your breeds is is amazing. But the win, anything in the over either overall is just an incredible feeling. They say uh, once is an occurrence, uh, twice, you know, uh, mm. twice is a coincidence, but three is a theme, I think. Yes. And yes, uh, this is I'm my, starting to see a theme with you and your hounds here. Yeah, this is my third opposite sex world show champion. My, um, my... My heartbeat, my Gracie won opposite sex in 2010. Her son, Cole, won it in 2020. And now uh, Mercy, which is Cole's sister, and um, won it today. Wow. So that's pretty awesome to have your your bloodline, your bread buys to uh, continue in their mother's footsteps like that is an incredible feeling. Yeah, that was that that's special and something that... Uh, not very many people can say that they yeah. have been crowned that as many times as you have. One of the more decorated people in the sport in this event, for sure. Um, uh, real quick, I want to talk to you about uh, about the podcast. A couple episodes back, mm -hmm. we were talking about some of your dogs in the top 10 standings. And uh, right. we uh, I may have made a little mistake on my end <laughs> talking about, uh, <laughs> about your female that's currently uh, – She's in the top, if not at the top, she she's near the, the top, top of the top ten. After Autumn Oak, she's second and okay. was second. So um yeah. in in the black and tan in the top ten. But yeah. yeah I don't she's know if, if you're happy with me or mad at me currently. I but know, I said you jinxed me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had said your female had one opposite sex at the world, but it was actually your male dog. Mm -hmm. And now here today your female kind of made a it made a believer out of me and it came yes. through. I, I guess yeah. it was a little premonition on my part. Yeah, it was pretty it was pretty cool though. It was pretty sweet though. That's <laughs> a that was pretty neat. She's had a we started the year off good at Grand American and then with my job judging assignment for Oaks, we kinda stepped back from showing this year and um, you know, just enjoyed the year and um enjoyed judging Oaks tremendously and right. then to uh get back into the show ring today and after being off, you know, pretty much all year and for her to perform like she did today and um, just really makes makes me proud. Yeah. 
What a year for you. And, and you talk, we obviously just had you on a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. in the Autumn Oaks podcast. Alan had a chance to talk to you about your judging assignment mm-hmm. at Oaks and probably hey, this, that and world, probably the two biggest judging yeah, assignments absolutely. that we have in UKC. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and doing that, that meant a lot to you. And now here, that's a, that's an yeah, it's awesome a, It's year been an awesome you. September. Yeah, it's <laughs> been an incredible September. That is for sure. One to remember. Talking yes. about events a little bit, is, is Autumn Oaks probably your favorite event of the year or world? Is that Autumn Oaks, as far as the whole event, yeah. I think is pretty much all of us's favorite just because it's more days, you know, you get to spend time with everybody and see everybody and enjoy the family and you know, and um, so that's, you know, it's just like a, it's to really, it has turned into a family reunion, basically, um, at, at Autumn Oaks, because you get to spend more days. This one, the pristine, of course, yes. of Worlds and Autumn Oaks both are, are ranked just one, two, yeah. you know, one, two. And um, it's, it's, any it's an incredible feeling to be able to sit here and, and to know that um, this was my third one. Yeah. All that's, with the black dogs. And two black awesome. dogs today and a black dog won the world. So that's awesome. I was going to say, there was a yes. good chance of a black dog winning Absolutely. today. Absolutely. That's what Madi- I told Madison when I come out of the ring. I said, one thing's for sure, Madison, a black dog is going to win the Worlds today. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that's pretty cool. Madison's a sweetheart, and I'm super proud of her and so happy for her and Chevy. That's a They've been a great team for a while and um, really a good accomplishment for her today and for the black and tan breed. I guess the only thing that was kind of frustrating today is that we're both uh, avid college football fans, yes. and we're both trying to watch our teams yes. play. We got the bench show going on right during Go it. Go Tigers. <laughs> they won today. Go Tigers. Yeah. So, uh, well, Lisa, I appreciate you taking a little bit Thank of time you. out of your day. I appreciate you guys, and I always appreciate UKC for everything they do for all of us. Well, I hope you have safe travels yes, home, sir. and we'll Thank see you. you at the next one. Yes, sir. See you soon. If you're trying to contact UKC, don't wait on hold. Use the online chat feature on ukcdogs.com. Yeah, we really hope that you guys enjoyed this uh, post-2022 Coonhound World Championship uh, podcast. Uh, we have part two coming out tomorrow where we're going to highlight a bunch of the interviews you and I were able to do while we were there at the World Championship. I know you got some good ones, right? Yeah, I talked. I had several good ones that I talked to. One of them is Philip Foster, one of our field reps from South Carolina. And Philip does such a fine job for us. He was the uh, the led the panel on Thursday night. And just they had a couple of questions and the way he dealt with those is is the way they should be dealt with. And so you'll hear from Philip and, and I know you talked to several folks as well. A good number of them. Yeah, I, I got some good interviews. Uh, w- one was with Kevin Cable. We talked about him and his line of dogs having six dogs in this field, three out of big money, three out of little money. We talked a little bit about that. And then I had a chance to talk to to Buzz Lynch, and that was just an awesome wrap to the weekend. So uh, be sure to listen to part two and we hope you guys enjoyed this. Thanks for listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and to like and follow UKC Hunting Ops on Facebook and Instagram.